Hello and welcome to this course on computational chemistry and classical molecular dynamics. This is an introductory course which will introduce you to different aspects of computational chemistry, different softwares as well as how to do classical molecular dynamics using public domain softwares. My name is B. L. Tembe from the Department of Chemistry, IIT Bombay. My email address is bltembe at chem.iitb.ac.in. Most of this lecture material is already available on the website. What I will be doing is to introduce different concepts and give the details of all the new things that you will learn and give additional information as we go along. So now the first question is why are we interested in computational chemistry? As far as chemistry is concerned, computers are tools just like spectrometers, calorimeters and other tools which are useful for chemists. Now using computers we can compute reasonable information on molecular and macroscopic chemical systems. We often hear in school that chemistry is an experimental science. But this statement is almost obsolete now because computational chemistry is now an accepted branch of chemistry just as your physical chemistry, organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. Now you may ask this question, before 1960 we were doing lot of chemistry when there were no computers at all. Now you may ask the question why do we need computers now? Let us take one or two examples. Suppose you want to go from Delhi to Mumbai. If you walk, it will take you about a month. So it is always possible to trans go from any point on earth to any other point by walking, but it will take you such a long time that it is not worth the effort. Another example would be, many of you must have heard of what a matrix and a determinant is. For example, consider a 2 by 2 determinant. A 2 by 2 determinant would be, suppose the matrix is A, B, C, D, the determinant is A, D minus B, C. So calculating the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix will take just about 30 seconds. Now consider a 12 by 12 determinant. To calculate the determinant by hand, it will take you more than the time of your life. So if an object takes more than a lifetime to calculate, certainly you will use any technique or instrument that will help you to do this faster. So one of the main advantage of computers is that in a very short time, it will give you a lot of information about molecular structures and changes in these molecular structures during reactions. And after all, that is what chemistry is all about. So these structures can only be computed now using programs that involve matrices, determinants, integration, roots of equation, differential equation, interpolations and so on. And bulk properties like entropy, energy, enthalpy, these all can be calculated as statistical averages over properties of molecular systems. So the final goal of this course would be how I can compute things of interest in chemistry using techniques like statistical averaging. So let us now go to what are the prerequisites for this course and what are the contents. So as far as prerequisites are concerned, if you have a good high school background of chemistry, physics and mathematics, uh, that is more than sufficient to learn all the contents of this course. And of course you will need some knowledge of thermodynamics that you have already studied in your 11th and 12th standards. Whatever ideas that are needed to understand the material of this course will be developed from first principles. As I mentioned earlier, the main contents are computers, programming, numerical methods, use of Scilab and Gromax software for classical molecular dynamics. So what are we going to do in today's lectures? Today's lecture is going to be a very elementary introduction about computers to the unexposed. Nowadays everybody knows about computers right from the school level, but when we studied chemistry we had not seen computers till we finished our master's degree. So we will talk about computers to the unexposed, we will talk of hardware and software, algorithms and programs, programming languages, operating systems, login, passwords, files. And finally, we will also discuss chemical applications of computers. So whenever you are using a computer, there is a part of the computer which you are allowed to use through a login and passwords. So it is like just as you have a house where you can live in a city, even on a computer there is an area of that computer which you kind of own and change at will. 
So for that you need a login and password so that you can work in that area. And in that area you can create several directories. Directories are like various cabins where you can store information. And the files that you will be using, every object in a computer is a file. For example, you have a program file, data file, video file, executable file, booting files, music files, video files, so on. These are all files which you can save and alter the way you want. Okay? And the operating system we will use for our course is Linux. Now why we use Linux? Because it is a free software, you can download it from the internet, there is no cost. So to everything that you do will be through the creation of a file. So to create or edit a file, suppose the file name is file.f, this is the name of that file. So to create or edit that file, I have to just type vi file.f in your Linux operating system. So our work will start with creating or editing files. So I have called it file.f. Now .f is an extension of the file. Okay. So different files will have different extension. We are interested in .f files because we will be mostly working in Fortran to begin with. You must be all very familiar with Windows software. That is a proprietary software, you have to pay for it. And as I mentioned, Linux, it is a public domain software. It is completely free and you can install the software on your own from a website. And you can upgrade it as you want a newer and newer version of it. So if you are not completely familiar, you can register and take a Linux short term course available near your place or you can learn it from YouTube or the website. Whatever you need for our work, we will discuss it as we go along in our course. So you must have all heard about computer programs. Computer programs all will need a computing language. Just as different states have different languages, computers also have different languages. The popular ones today are C, C++, Java, Visual Basic, Fortran, Pascal, SQL. There are many, many languages. They keep changing. In fact, there are many languages I learnt and which are obsolete now. So as we go along, even the language may change, but the basic logic and ideas are very, very uniform. Concepts are the same, the way you write in different language it is different. Mostly we will use Fortran because it is an old language and many of the chemistry programs are still written in Fortran. And there are programs now to convert from one language to another. So if you write a program in Fortran, you can always convert that from Fortran to C. If you have a program in C, you can convert that from C to Fortran. So that option is there, but once we understand different concepts of this language, then we will be able to do whatever programs we want. So now let us see what Fortran is all about. Fortran is nothing but formula translation. So we will be using mostly Fortran 77. Now what is a formula translation? In mathematics you will write y is equal to x to the power of half. But when you do a program, the entire line in a program should be in one line. You cannot have superscript and subscript and so on. So in the program, this mathematical expression is written as y equals square root of x. See that this is entirely in one line. Now similarly, suppose you want y is equal to x cubed. That superscript 3, I cannot write on one line. So the way it is written on a computer or the way it is translated in Fortran is y is equal to x star star x. This star star means raising an object to the power. In this case, y is raised, x is raised to the power of x. The other way to do it would be x star x star x. Okay? So there are certain differences between x to the power of x and x cubed. So we will come to it at a later stage. Then the other functions that you are used to are something like y is equal to cos x, this is a function, tan x, this is another function, log x. So actually in Fortran you do not call it logx, you call it algx because this is a log function. So this function is to the base e, whereas a log 10x is to the base 10. Most of the logarithms that you use are to the base 10, so a log 10x will be a function where you have calculated a log to the base 10. So now you consider another function y equal to x star star 3, the whole thing star star 4. 
what do you think this is? This is nothing but inside the bracket you have x raised to power 3 and the whole thing is raised to the power 4. So, this is how you write a complicated function in just a one linear way on a single line that you type on your computer. Okay. So, another function would be suppose you want a sin x y will be a sin x will be uh, your hyperbolic sin or in some computers it could be sin hyperbolic x. So, different functions have different representation in your programming language. So, as you go along you will be able to do all those transformations. Now, let us see what are some of the important rules in Fortran. As every language has its own character, Fortran also has its own character. For example, if you write Hindi or Sanskrit, you start writing from left to right. But if you write Urdu, you will be starting from right to left. So, each language will have its own rules and when you write your programs in Fortran, all the rules you should be very, very familiar with. Okay. So, on this particular slide, I am listing some of the most crucial rules that are required when you write the program. So, what is the first rule? Every statement that you write in a program should start from the seventh column. That is, you will not start writing from the first column of your line, you start from the seventh column because first column to sixth column have a different role. For example, you see the next line. From first to fifth column, they are used to give line numbers to your lines. Usually, you do not have to give any line number but the first 5 columns are used to give line numbers to the program. And now suppose your line extends more than 80 or 100 characters. If the line is very, very long, you cannot write on a single line. So, you will have to go to the next line. So, what you do? You start typing from the 7th column on line 1 and if it extends more than the first line, in the second line you give some character on column 6. If you give some character on column 6, for example, say 1, 2, 3, it could be any character. If you give a character on column 6, it says that the earlier line is continued on the second line. So, suppose your material is not complete even in the second line, you may want to go to the third line. Then what you do? Go complete your second line, go to the third line and in the sixth column of the third line, put something 1, 2, 3 in the sixth column and continue. So, that way you can write long programming lines using Fortran. And many times when you write a program, you may want to write some comments because when you write a program today and look at it say after 6 months, you will not know what the program is all about. So, you may want to write several comments so that it will help you to recognize what you have done. These are like notes that you write. So, any comment line will start with a C in the first column. So, you have a you have a line and if you put a C in the first column, that is just a comment and the program will not execute it. So, these comment lines are very, very useful. So, using these comment lines, uh, you can find out what the program is all about or what your intention was or you may have taken the program from some reference. You can give that reference in that comment line and you can do many things using comment cards. In fact, writing good comments about your program is very, very useful in the future. Then the other most important thing which you will need is that each variable will be having a name in the program. Just as you have your name and my name and in the computer program you have x, y, z, w. So many constants are there in chemistry, you have Planck's constant, Avogadro number. Each variable has to have a name. So, the name has to begin with one of the 26 letters of the alphabet. What Fortran does? Uh, computers distinguish between integers and real numbers. Integers are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whereas real numbers are 1.23, 1.44. So, on a computer, representing integers is different from representing real numbers. So, what Fortran does? If you have integers, those integers will have variables which start with letters i, j, k, l, m, n. So, what you have to do whenever you have variables in Fortran, there will be two types of variables, real variables and inter integer variables. All the integer variables you start with i, j, k, l, m, n. So, this looks like a very complicated thing when you begin with, 
but as you start programming this will become your second nature. So, it is not such a complex thing. So, as you go along you will be able to do this. Okay? So, now before you write a program the entire idea has to be put in what is called an algorithm. So, you would see you look up the meaning of the word algorithm in a dictionary. So, an algorithm is a unambiguous sequence of steps or statements required to carry out that task. So, if you want to write a good program you should have a good algorithm based on which you are writing the program. Okay? So, let us consider an example. Suppose you want to go to your house in your hometown and somebody will ask you to give directions. So, if you give directions the direction should be given in such a way that the person will reach your house without asking anybody. If you just give him the direction, if you just give him the home address and ask him to go, he will not know where to go. So, for example, let us see the following uh, algorithm uh, which gives you how to reach your address. Suppose your address is 33 Tenzing Street, Darjeeling 773347. This is your address. Now, you, you have a stranger and you want to tell him how to go to this address. So, what will you do? You will say that let him go to the nearest railway station next to you. Of course, you have to give again direction how to reach that railway station, but we will come to that later. Then he has to take a train to Darjeeling and how he will go to Darjeeling? He has to go to Calcutta first and then from Calcutta to Siliguri and then from Siliguri to Darjeeling and once he reaches Darjeeling he has to find that address. Nowadays you have Google and Google Maps. So, before you tell anybody to go somewhere it is best to show on a Google map what that address is because once the person knows the map he need not talk to anybody because the map itself gives you an algorithm. After all what is a map? Map is just all the objects are there they are linked through roads. So, the moment you see a map you will know all the roads that connect to the house and he himself can come with an algorithm. What is his algorithm? He will draw a line from his present location to that location in Darjeeling. So, that is how he will reach that place. So, your algorithm is really follow the path given by the line and each line will tell you whether to turn left, right very unambiguously. There is So, one of the things is in an algorithm everything has to be very precise. For example, suppose your mother tells you buy some vegetables in the market. You will go to the market then there are so many vegetables you are confused as to what to buy then you will again call her. So, that is not a good algorithm. A good algorithm will be your mother will tell you half a kilo of this, quarter kilo of this, 100 grams of this everything precise then that is an algorithm. So, a good algorithm is a basis on which good programs can be written. But once you get more experience with this you do not really need algorithms you will start writing programs from the scratch. So, what I will do now I am going to give an example of this program. So, let us see an example of this program then you will be able to proceed in this way. So, what we have done is this program it is a very simple program it will read some integers and it will sum those integers and it will write the result on your screen. So, this is a simple program which will read some objects which will sum those objects and write the result on the screen. So, let us see how this program is written. So, the first line it begins with a comment first character first column when there is a comment we already said it is a comment card it will not execute it will not do anything it is just information. So, this says this is my first program. So, this is a comment line. So, the next line is program my program this is an optional line you do not really have to say it, but it is always good to give a name to the program. So, what I have done I have called it my program and see that I have started this program in the seventh column. Remember what was our basic rule that everything you write as a program line should start with a seventh column. So, I have this is my second line. The third line C it says input an integer. So, when you see this line you will know that what you want to try to do in your program is that the program should read an integer. Now, next line really is your first important line in a program. It says again from the seventh column read into bracket star comma star bracket complete n. So, remember I said earlier 
that whenever a variable begins with i, j, k, l, m, n, it is an integer. So, what this line says, read an integer n from your screen. So, how do I tell the program it is from the screen? That is what this into bracket star comma star is doing. Whenever you have this into bracket star comma star, you are reading from the screen and you are writing to the screen. So, in the next line, you have read that integer n from the screen. So, once you read that n, now again I have a comment card. The comment card says that some integers from 1 to n. So, what your program is going to do? Your program is going to sum 1, 2, 3, 4 all the way up to n. n could be anything. Of course, n cannot be infinity because if n is infinity, your computer will not be able to do it. n is some integer typically in thousands, it can be 10,000. Okay? And what you want to do? You want to sum all those numbers up to n. Now, suppose you have to do this by hand. I ask you to sum 1 to n. So, it will take you forever unless you know what is the formula for that sum. In fact, it was Gauss who gave first the formula how to sum from 1 to n, but that we will discuss later. So, now we want to do it through a program. So, up to this point you have read what is that integer n and you want to start summing. Whenever you start summing numbers, you want to initialize sum to 0. Okay? Because when you want to add 100 numbers, you go on taking the first number, to that number you add the second, to that number you add the third. So, there is some box which you initialize and keep on adding the sum into that box. So, what I have called in the next line m sum equal to 0 that says that I have a variable called m sum, I have assigned the value 0. In any program equal to is not really mathematical equal to, it means that whatever is on the right side that object is assigned to the variable on the left. m sum here is a variable, to that variable I have assigned the value 0. So, now my real programming starts. I want to start with 0 and go on adding first the number 1 to 0, so my sum is 1, then I will add 2 to that, my sum is 3, then I will add 3 to that, my sum is 6. So, I have to keep on adding 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all that into that box. So, this whole process of repeating something is called a do loop. It is an iterative procedure. An iterative procedure is a procedure where you keep on doing it repeatedly until some condition is satisfied. For example, I tell you keep on counting from 1 to 30,000 until you reach 30,000. So, what you will do? You will keep on counting 1, 2, 3, 4 until that 30,000 you will keep on counting. So, that is your repeated operation. Now, what I have told in the program? In the program I say do 10 i going from 1 to n. So, this is a statement which tells the program that this is a repeated operation you have to do until certain condition is satisfied. So, the repeated operation will come after the do statements. So, do 10 this 10 is not a number 10 it is a line number. What it tells the program is up to up to the statement which has a line number 10 all those operations are repeated. Okay, what are the operations? You start the operation with i going from 1 up to n. Okay. So, this means all the statements up to line number 10 are repeated starting with i equal to 1 then up to i equal to n. So, the first time i will be 1. So, I go to the next line. The next line says m sum is equal to m sum plus i. So, you know that already the m sum was defined to be 0. So, what this line does? Now, go to the right side m sum had the value 0. To that value of m sum it adds the value i. What was the value of i? i was equal to 1 the first time. So, the next value of m sum is 0 plus 1. So, m sum will be 1 and once it does that it goes to the next line it says 10 continue. So, 10 continue means go back to this do statement. So, when I come to this second time i has now become equal to 2 now because first time it was 1, next time it will be 2. So, when i is equal to 2, now I go to the next line, again it says m sum equal to m sum plus 1. Now, m sum was already 1 in the last calculation, to that m sum I add 2. 
So, the sum is 3. So, the new value of m sum is 3 and it says continue. So, continue means go back. It goes back to this do statement. So, when it goes back to the do statement, now i has already completed the work for 1 and 2. This time n will be 3. So, when you go to the next line, m sum will be old value of m sum plus this 3. So, already there was 3 before to that I add the new value 3. So, my m sum will be 6 and I go to the next line, I continue. Next time when I do that, now n is equal to 4, my m sum is already 6, to that I add 4, so it will be 10, new value of m sum, it becomes 10 and it goes to continue. So, I keep on repeating this operation until I calculate up to n. Suppose n is 100, then I will be doing this loop all the way from 1 to 100 and once n is 100, when it goes to 10 continue, it knows that i has already reached the maximum value of n, so it will come outside the loop. So, this do loop has already a conditional statement that do all these operations up to n equal to the maximum value which is assigned in the read statement and it comes out. Once it comes out, write star comma star n comma m sum. Now, n is the starting value of n you have read and it will print that n and it will also write the value of m sum. So, once it has done all the calculation, you tell the computer to stop and end the program. So, again I have a comment here, I have said use all small case letters for convenience because many computers do distinguish between capital letters and small letters. It is best that you distinguish capital from small, so that there will be no confusion at the end. It may so happen that it may take small and capital to be the same, but since you are a programmer, everything you do should be unique. So, this is the simplest program you started with. So, what we will do next time, we will again start with this elementary program, discuss what were the rules we had and what the program is, then we will see what to do next with this program, because this program is in some computing language. Now, I want to convert that into a situation which is convenient for me. We will stop here and in the next class we will continue at this point. Thank you.